Okay, good morning, everyone. You're very welcome to our webinar this morning. My name is Aoife Smith, and I'm your moderator for today. Myself and my colleague, Declan Phelan, um, who's helping me um, with the technical support this morning, so hopefully this goes off without a hitch. Um, we're part of the consortium team at the National Rural Network, otherwise known as the NRN. Um, for anyone who is unaware, we are led by Irish Rural Link, um, and we are a consortium with the team NUIG and then ourselves at Philip Farley and Company. We are funded through the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine underneath the Rural Development Programme. And our main objective is to build and sustain a membership based network where we disseminate key information um, on the fundings available under the Rural Development Programme. So just before we kick off um, this webinar, just to let you all know, it will be recorded and will be available on our NRN YouTube channel and shared on our social media networks over the next few days. Um, I'd also like to encourage you to use the Q&A tab um, at the bottom of your screen to ask um, any questions that you may have throughout the two presentations that we have for you here this morning. Um, my colleague Declan there will monitor the, the questions that you're, you're posing and um, we'll, we'll ask them to our speakers after the two presentations. Um, so as you all know, this morning's webinar is titled um, Sequestering Carbon, Irish Soils and Practical Measures. Biodiversity loss and climate change are two very pre pressing challenges that we face. The soil, its biodiversity, its capacity to store and release carbon and how we manage, manage it are all very important aspects which we'll try and touch on today. Um, we have two very excellent speakers um, who we're delighted to um, help us with the presentation this morning. Um, so we're going to have a researcher's perspective. So Lillian O'Sullivan is there from Chagas and the farmer's perspective. Um, we have Walter Furlong um, there as well. Um, so you're, you're all very welcome here this morning. Um, Lillian, you're first up this morning with your presentation. Um, I'll just do a brief introduction while, while you're getting set up. Um, Lillian is a research officer in the Environment of Soils and Land Use Department of Chagas, based in Johnstown Castle, County Wexford. Um, her research interests include sustainable soils, land use, and understanding how soils are part of a larger system. Um, and I won't do you any justice by saying much more, so I, I'll let you take over there, Lillian. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Aoife. Uh, just to check, you can hear me okay, Aoife? and see my screen. Yeah, perfect, that's ready to go. Wonderful, great. Okay, so uh, as Aoife mentioned, I'm a research officer with Chagask. I'm based in Wexford, in, as she said, in the Environment, Soils and Land Use Department. So today I'm going to talk uh, a bit about some of the carbon research that we have ongoing. Uh, very much uh, what I'm showing today is the work of many of my colleagues. And also we have more extended uh, presentations available uh, if you want to look up our time uh, research insights uh, link on our Tagus website. But okay, we'll go ahead and we'll uh, dive straight in. Um, I think it's important to just start and touch on why is this whole topic of soil organic carbon uh, really important and more and more important. But of course, the main reason is that we know it can enhance carbon sinks because it can directly uh, remove carbon dioxide from our atmosphere. It can store it in soil or woody biomass. And this is really, I suppose, one of the more important things from a societal perspective, the role of soil as a carbon sink. But of course, of course, soils can be a sink, but they can also be a source dependent upon management. Uh, soil organic carbon, um, it also allows for better retentions, uh, retention of ammonium N, uh, potassium, calcium. So it's very important too from a soil health and, and fertility perspective. It also keeps phosphorus available at high and low pH and it reduces bulk density. So we know in Ireland, um, one of the key threats to soils is compaction associated with the management regime. Um, but of course, if you manage your soil organic carbon, it can help um, you know, retain a more optimal bulk density, limit that compaction, which can in turn uh, limit environmental losses associated uh, with runoff. And it also improves soil water holding capacity. So altogether, soil organic carbon, it's really important uh, from a soil health perspective, but also to more and more from its climate regulation potential. 
So I thought it was pertinent to start maybe by just having this uh, graph, which is effectively, uh, you know, the, the carbon cycle, but uh, the whole basis centers around photosynthesis that draws carbon dioxide from the atmosphere that's utilized then to grow biomass in our trees, our crops and grass, etc. But of course, these are living, uh, so they too respire some of that carbon they take in back to the atmosphere. Uh, but we also have roots and litter fall that are incorporated back into the system. But then too, in the soil, we have microbes that also respire and release uh, carbon dioxide back out uh, to the atmosphere. So then when we think that we also have some carbon that's leached down uh, out of the system, uh, and when we consider some of the crop offtakes and the biomass that's taken away, essentially what's left in the soil is the carbon that's sequestered. And as a rule of thumb, that's estimated to be about 10% of what's taken in. So um, uh, so ecosystems that sequester more than they emit, those are carbon sinks, uh, whereas those that can release or do release are called our carbon sources. And I just wanted to mention that on balance, our grasslands, even though our mineral grasslands are, um, you know, have capacity to be sinks uh, because we have a proportion of organic uh, high carbon soils that have been drained for agriculture on balance, uh, those are offsetting the sink potential of the mineral one. So, so that's something we'll come to a bit more um, shortly. But altogether, I suppose the main point is that carbon sequestration can help us to balance our greenhouse gas emissions. And we have already in Tagus put out there our marginal abatement cost curve. And what that is, is essentially a graph that allows us to see the abatement potential of different measures. So you have the different measures, uh, what they can um, save in terms of emissions uh, set against what they cost. So here we have uh, the land use carbon sequestration MAC. And we see, of course, forestry is uh, our main uh, mitigation from a land use perspective uh, measure currently uh, with about 2 0.1 megatons of CO2 equivalent. But of course, we know in arable systems, cover crops, strong corporation, they also um, can generate some savings, but are more expensive. Uh, whereas uh, the pasture management measures in the MAC are, are cost beneficial because they're below the zero. And then there's also scope to manage organic soils through water table management. Often people are saying, well, how much is it? Um, but it's important to mention that it's actually very difficult to measure carbon sequestration. So uh, it's something we as researchers are working and working and trying to refine methods in the space the whole time. But um, really what's happening in the soil is you have a very small input to a very large background. So if you think if you add a half a ton, for example, uh, to a hectare that already has a couple of hundred uh, tons of carbon, uh, then that's very difficult to see that accumulation. It takes a very long time uh, to build up. So this be makes it very hard to measure on, a, on an annual ongoing basis. So then how are we measuring it or, or what are the different ways that we can measure it and are doing um, through our work? Uh, of course, because it does take a long time. Um, one of the things that's important to have is long-term experiments. And we need these so that we can assess over a longer time period um, how managements affect the balance of carbon in the soil. So you'll have a baseline carbon um, and it gets to an equilibrium, but then you introduce a management change, which uh, brings you to point B and over time, a new equilibrium is established. And in this instance here, we see that uh, this management has uh, had a positive effect. And this difference here is the sequestration that can be accounted for in the inventories. But of course, uh, that's reversed. It's very slow often and uh, it needs to actually be established for the same and different soil types across um, different land uses and management regimes. But then we also have um, 
uh, are eddy covariance towers. Uh, and these, unlike the long-term experiments, uh, can give you an animal, uh, sorry, an annual estimate. Um, so these are towers, they use sensors to measure the greenhouse gas fluxes. So eddies are gas bubbles, they move through the atmosphere and as the gas uh, changes, uh, it changes the eddy and the concentrations of the gases and the sensor picks this up and over time then this allows us to be able to improve our estimates of the carbon sequestration under different soil types and farm managements. And more recently we have our national Agricultural Soil uh, Observatory, or NASCO, uh, is currently being rolled out, which will allow us to uh, put some more towers around the country and allow us to be able to try and um, measure across different um, scenarios. And then, of course, we have uh, controlled experiments. Uh, here at the bottom, you see an example of an experiment in Johnstown Castle, where you apply a distinct label on the carbon, and this can be followed uh, right through the system. So how much of it is uh, taken up in the plant, how much is being respired, what's happening in the soil and the fate of all of this. And it can be measured at different stages and it isolates what's happening to that carbon as opposed to the whole pool. So it really can uh, help advance your understanding of, of what's happening um, to carbon uh, as part of the system. But it's also the case and important to mention that not all carbon is the same. So different carbon pools in the soil, they have different biological stability, decomposition rate and turnover time. So what we have is we've carbon that's very unprotected. It's very labile, which means it's very free moving. It can be readily mineralized by, by, by biology in the soil, uh, but it's very labile and can turn over quickly in a period of maybe weeks, years. And on the one hand, this is a really good indication of biological fertility because there's good nutrient uh, turnover. It's also quite readily uh, lost as CO2 back to the atmosphere. So, uh, however, as uh, organic matter keeps getting broken down, uh, what we see is that it becomes more protected the longer it stays in the system. And so what you can have is, is carbon that becomes more uh, physiochemically protected. So it's associated to uh, smaller particles in the soil and it's um, more difficult for microbes uh, to, to break down until ultimately you get a chemically protected um, uh, carbon that is very difficult to mi for microbes to, to break down and that is really truly sequestered carbon. So if you have a soil and they have, uh, if you have two soils and they have the same organic matter, but one has more recalcitrant, so a more protected carbon, while it's less fertile, it has lower bioavailability, so it's less available um, for, uh, for microbes. However, it has a higher mean resi residence time of carbon, so it's a much more stable, uh, protected carbon. And so this is kind of, these are the important um, considerations when we're thinking of climate mitigation and soil fertility and so forth. And we have looked at that. Um, so where is the carbon stored? And what we do see is that indeed most of the carbon uh, is in the uh, top soil, this top 30 centimeters, and it's associated with these bigger aggregated soil sizes. So going from small to large, we see most of that carbon is in the top soil. And that's the level that's measured for inventories and, um, and so forth. However, what's also very interesting is that we found uh, is that uh, we have this more protected uh, carbon at depth. We have brown earths that have uh, quite a lot of carbon at depth, but also uh, then we have this very protected um, carbon associated uh, with these smaller aggregate sizes, which makes them more physically protected, um, so they can be a longer term sink for carbon sequestration in subsoils. So while it's a smaller pool, it has a lot more protective uh, capacity. 
Um, and of course, while that 30 centimeters depth is interesting um, in terms of capturing uh, the magnitude, it doesn't actually capture the quality or the residence time uh, from a, a climate mitigation perspective. Um, also, just to say, uh, we have also developed a harmonized uh, classification of Irish soils. And here what you see are three graphs that show um, uh, soil organic carbon, their spatial distribution and their variation. And what we see is that in mineral soils, uh, we have about 1,800 uh, megatons, which is million tons of CO2 equivalent. And uh, we also looked at what that pool at depth represents, and that uh, um, represents about 253 megatons at national scale. And I suppose when you pitch that against the context of a whole, uh, our, our whole of sector, or not sector, but our total annual emissions for Ireland are about 60 uh, megatons of CO2 equivalent. So really there is a challenge there to, I suppose, protect those, but also think about ways that we can enhance uh, those carbon pools at depth. Um, so while I've spoken a bit there about uh, mineral soils, it's also true that we have a very important uh, carbon stock in our peat soil. So we have uh, in Ireland about 20 to 25 percent almost of uh, peat soils, uh, but we did do a study where we looked at what are or what is the role of artificially uh, drained agricultural land for those very carbon rich soils. And what we see is that uh, when we model this, that we have somewhere around 300 uh, plus thousand hectares uh, of peat, so soils with greater than 20% organic carbon, and those uh, represent an annual um, emission source of about 8.7 megatons of CO2 equivalent. We also have peaty minerals, um, which are mineral soils that have a peaty uh, top layer, and those two have a, a substantial uh, loss. But I suppose, you know, if we think about what can we do? Is there something we can do in terms of managing water table? Can we make some savings? And we just simulated a, a modeling exercise and uh, annual savings were estimated if you, if you re-wet half of those drained peats, uh, savings were estimated at 3.2 megatons of CO2 equivalent. So then if we start to think about translating that more in the direction of management, um, what we're talking about really is needing to take a spatially targeted approach to managing soil or car organic carbon and thinking about the types of soils that we have on our farm. So if we have peaty organic soils, they have greater than 20% carbon. Um, those are really important um, carbon stock. And if uh, oxygen is introduced to that, uh, then they can re represent serious losses and offset, as we mentioned earlier, the benefits of mineral um, grasslands, for example. We also have mineral where um, mineral soils, so uh, much lower uh, carbon uh, content. And then we have our humic soils, which are where we see over time a humic or peaty layer has accumulated uh, at the surface. So uh, in terms of our land uses, um, most of our cropland, of course, is on mineral soils, which tend to show about one to four percent soil organic carbon. Uh, grasslands, uh, mineral grasslands, two to seven percent. And then, of course, our peat soils are anywhere up to 50 percent soil organic carbon and a very fibrous uh, peat. But we know, of course, that sandy soils. So if you think in terms of our texture, they have lower capacity to hold carbon compared to higher clay uh, content soils. And of course, water table alteration and introduction of oxygen is going to be really um, crucial in determining the balance uh, of, of carbon in, in soils. Uh, so we've also looked at the potential for sequestration in subsoil in, in our square project below 30 centimetres. And here you see those three different uh, soil categories. And what we see is that uh, they all have considerable uh, capacity to soar uh, soils at depth. 
but um, these poorly, uh, so poorly drained soils, of course, they're uh, more affected by soil compaction, which can impede their rooting depth. Now, if we think that rooting depth is a mechanism to, to draw down more carbon to deeper layers, uh, these soils need particular management because uh, those are also the soils that have greater uh, capacity to protect carbon in the soils. But all of that hinges, of course, on, on careful management and limiting uh, soil compaction. Um, uh, but how can we protect then also soil carbon levels? So we also have a long term uh, experiment here. You see a study in Knockbeg Oak Park where we looked at soil organic carbon over a long time series. And uh, as you can see, um, we had a grassland that was converted uh, to a cropland. And what we see, of course, is that immediate uh, fall off. But then we started to look at different managements such as reduced till and, and straw and what you can see is that over time the treatments begin to enhance carbon levels and potentially carbon sequestration over time. Um, another experiment is a long-term experiment that's been initiated to look at uh, grassland reseeding methods. Here are three different reseeding, um, no till or stitching versus conventional plowing to 20 centimetres or deep plowing to 40 centimetres. Now, of course, you might ask, uh, why would you deep plow if you, you know, potentially turn down your, your fertility? But we wanted to explore, I suppose, what happens if you can pump carbon uh, further down to where it's less exposed uh, to losses and can we enhance longer term storage in soils. Uh, there's also experiments ongoing looking at uh, monograss, multi-species that have deeper uh, rooting where it might be less um, exposed to the oxygen layer and then again in turn have more uh, potential for longer term storage. So these are just a few of some of the ongoing experiments. Um, but we also are looking at things like uh, hedgerows. So we have another experiment ongoing. Uh, people often say, oh, well, you know, what about our hedgerows? Because of course, uh, hedgerows are an important uh, element on our landscapes. We know that they occupy, you know, 680,000 uh, kilometers. Um, but uh, what uh, we want to do in this experiment for the first time is to take some direct measurements so that we can relate a biomass volume, so a volume is calculated using a remote measurement, can we relate that then to a carbon stock? Um, because people say, well, how can you, um, how can, can we look at this for inventories and different things? But we cannot um, do that unless we have methodologies that allow us to assess carbon stock changes over time. Um, so of course, this is uh, trying to move in that direction. That work is ongoing and currently we're at laboratory analysis uh, stage with that. So then uh, just finally, I suppose, in terms of the work uh, from, um, from this research, uh, where we look at land use and management, uh, you know, over time with, I suppose, an expansion of the work that's ongoing now, um, the aim is to be able to estimate the capacity of Irish soils to sequester uh, carbon. Um, so we know quite a bit about that, but there's still a lot uh, to be, um, to be understood there, but also then to quantify the impacts of management strategies on carbon sequestration in mineral soils. Also, what are the strategies that could help us to reduce losses from managed peat soils? Um, and then what kind of data can we use or, or develop to model the impact of carbon management uh, in terms of our greenhouse gas emissions? And of course, all of this is uh, to help us uh, support uh, the generation of verified results in terms of our carbon accounting uh, in agricultural uh, soils. Okay, so that was very much uh, a whistle stop tour. Uh, wanted to try, I suppose, to give a little bit of the scientific background and just, I suppose, some of the insights into some of the ongoing research. And uh, I'm happy to take questions. Uh, well, I know we'll be doing that at the end, but I'll pass you back now to Aoife and thank you. Yeah, no, that's brilliant, Lillian. Um, that, 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 that's absolutely excellent. It was very informative and a wealth of information there. Um, I, I know it's just the tip of the iceberg um, for, for, what, for the knowledge and the research that you're involved in. Um, so 
uh, I, hopefully we can address and explore that a little bit further in, in the questions after after this. Um, so now I'd like to introduce you to um, our second speaker, um, Walter Furlong. Walter is a very busy farmer. He graduated with a bachelor's of uh, a bachelor's business degree um, from Dublin Business School and has completed his green cert from Kildalton College. Um, he manages over 4,000 um, acres uh, in Cayman County Wexford of, of Tillage Ground. And um, he also works within the Cooney uh, Furlong Grain Company where he's trade, trade, tra trading and hedging um, grain. So I, I don't want to mess up your introduction, Walter, because um, uh, I, I don't want to not give you as much justice as you deserve. But um, I think Declan is going to share your presentation. And um, so you, you can, you can uh, get going on that, Walter. That, that's brilliant. Thank you. Thanks, Aoife. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I've just been asked to do a presentation on our approach to uh, sustainable farming and cover cropping here in Wexford. Um, I'll just start with just kind of an introduction to Cooney Farland Target and Walter Farland Grain, and then uh, I'll move on to what we're doing here on the farm. Um, uh, next slide, please, Declan. So there's kind of three companies operating out of the one spot here in um, Cam. There's Cooney Farlong, Target Fertilizers and Walter Farlong Grain. Um, Cooney Farlong was founded in 98 with Kevin Cooney and, and my father Walter. Um, and over the years, it's, it's, a, it's, it's just a marching company. So over the years, we've grown into having three kind of retail branches selling feed, uh, fort, chemicals, um, dosing, um, weldings, hardware, that kind of stuff. And then obviously dealing with farmers on the retail sense on, on seed and fort and all the rest of it around Wexford. Um, we supply Diageo and IDL and these uh, companies with food grade barley and uh, then obviously take in and dry um, various various types of crops all around Wexford. Um, Target Fertilizers was then also founded in 1998 uh, with Kevin Walter um, and John Grennan. So it's grew since 98 to about 20 to 22 percent of the Irish market, uh, wholesale into merchants and co-ops all over Ireland. Um, so, you know, yourself, it's um, just general law, all kind of fertilizers across Ireland. And then uh, what's le left is the farm. So my father started farming here in 78, um, starting out with a roughly about 100 acres. And we're now up to 4,200 odd acres um, around the Wexford area in about 33 kilometers, 35 kilometers of home here. Um, we're growing a range of crops, um, wheat, barley, oats, rape, beans, um, rye, um, but it's kind of a 50-50 kind of thing, so 50% spring crops, 50% winter crops. Um, if you move on to the next slide there now, please, Declan. And that's just, that's just kind of during the harvest here in Coney Furlong, we have plenty of barley coming in, has, so kind of mountains of it really. Um, next slide, please, Declan. And that's just some of the storage units here in Coney Furlong. Um, next slide. And that's the farms, the combines, and the, and the spreaders and stuff. Next slide. Um, once again, the farm, fertilizer. Now you can keep going, Declan. Um, now, when we started, um, we started min tilling in 1999. Uh, we were plowing up until then, and we decided to go down the mill till route. Um, for the first, you could say five, six years, my father was saying that they struggled big time with, it, with various different reasons. They were uh, at, initially we were grubbing too light. We were grubbing at, or cultivating, I should say. We kind of say grubbing down here, but kind of at two and three inches. And what was happening was we'd we saw the corn whether it be winter or spring, and we get this slap of rain. It was kind of game over. Um, so we kind of we actually bought a valve set top down around. I think it was all three or all two. And that kind of revolutionized the tilling because we were able to go down deeper, down to anywhere, we're tilling anywhere from now till four to six inches, which allowed for the water. But we were still running into the problem that on our spring barley ground, because we're predominantly spring barley, we're growing about anywhere from 1,800 acres to, to nine, uh, uh, 1,700 to 1,900 acres of spring barley year for, for food grade, for mountain and stuff. So we were running into the problems of, um, the kind of ground getting spun out it was on light ground and it was just 
the ground was just getting shook like so we kind of we went in with a mustard cover crop in 2004 and uh, just trying it in a few places just just these big crops of mustard act as a beret crop nearly for our spring barley the following season um now since then the system actually hasn't changed that much we wore chop on all our straw back then um and now with uh, around i think it was around oh nine or ten we started uh, baling again um it was just because look at the money started coming back into straw um and that has kind of affected the system slightly because back then we were only seeing it so on kind of single variety um cover crops and now we're up to seven way mixes and five way mixes and four way mixes but the straw the straw is kind of an, a hindrance to a degree when it comes to cover cropping because you're cutting whenever at the end of july early august and you're trying to get this straw bale and everyone knows the bale and straw is not simple in this country so it's kind of it's it you might lose a week when you should be sowing cover crops basically with the straw but it's something we kind of we, you, people always argue with us that you know if you chop the straw you'll be adding back organic matter and stuff but we kind of make the argument that our cover crops are doing that for us but i'll get to that um soon and um, next slide please Declan. now we seed selection is kind of we've done an awful lot of work with journal um ireland and robbie burns and these these kind of people around the country on cover crops and the main reason we kind of got into cover crops, like I said, was to kind of act as a break. But when we started doing Philip, our late colleague Philip was kind of the lead research on her in from here. Like we kind of like cover crops kind of bind the roots together and mop up a lot of nutrients in the soil. These nutrients then um grow the cover crop for you during the winter. So it'll grow biomass above the ground and below the ground. The through the process of photosynthesis, the sunlight is uh, is converted and it creates energy in the in the cover crops, which uh, runs sugar, kind of these sugars down into the roots, and these sugars are uh, excreted as exudates, and soil biology in the land then feeds on these exudates. So when you see when you kind of turn over our soil now, you see this kind of vibrant soil. It's nearly alive, like, um, and that's through these sugars. Now that's the kind of scientific approach that 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 people will talk about. But when we started looking at, it, we were just doing say mustard. But mustard is kind of when you saw a single cup of mustard, uh, it's very hard to get rid of. Um, it can be very stringy and it can be very tough to to desiccate in in the spring. So we started working with cover with with germal and we started using the likes of phacelia and tillage radish, clover, uh, vetch, uh, buckwheat. Uh, leafy turn of forage rape and these kind of things now the they all have their own benefits and that's kind of why it's so important to kind of do a bigger mix because <laughs> it's kind of like if if you're a a worm or a or a fungi or whatever in the soil like you'll get fed up eating mustard all day every day if you kind of want it's like eating chips every day of the week you want to have something different like so we did a lot of research in america about this and talked to people over there so we were starting to use, say the likes of a tillage radish. So if you see tillage radish, it's a big long taproot, but it also has a lot of biomass above the ground, but the taproot goes right down. Uh, we don't even know how deep it goes because you can never get to the end of it. And it's a big mass of, there could be three or four inches of a root in it. And it, it breaks the pan, any pans or any compaction issues. But what it also does is it'll let the water run the whole way down the root. So there's none of this issues with, um, with water standing on fields or anything like that. Phacelia is the other one, um, that's a massive one for us, them two in particular, because Phacelia grows very quickly and very aggressively and it creates a lot of biomass again, but it, it's, its root system is very fibrous and it's, it kind of spreads out. And what it does is it tills the top three or four inches of the ground. It makes the ground very uh, friable and, and, and a great tilt and it's just, it's great to get going. Then you have the likes of vetches, which are legumes to, um, to fix nitrogen over the winter. Um, we've we've been using hair and hairy vetch is a new one we use now because it's more winter tolerant um, the frost doesn't kill it as quick um, buckwheat was another one that we use uh, for sca uh, scavenging phosphorus so to say that buckwheat will capture phosphorus but actually and return it to the soil and make it available um, we've uh, what else do we have we've 
we've gone back to using mustard. We stopped using mustard for years because of issues killing it. And we found out lately about, well, a year and a half ago that Research in America has shown that mustard actually biofumigates the soil and can actually kill. Brassicas in general do that, but mustard is, is leading the pack. And what it does is it'll, uh, it'll kill soil pathogens like fusarium. And fusarium was the one we were very interested in because down here in Wexford, not this harvest now, but last harvest on the intakes here around Wexford for ourselves. And we were noticing we had big fusarium problems. And there was an awful lot of barley here uh, rejected from all on fusarium issues. So we started introducing, this year we introduced mustard again to hopefully combat this slightly. Um, we've used peas before. We've sowed, we had to use, we spread them before. We used a spreader actually to spread them out because you couldn't meter them out with the, with the bio drill. And uh, I think we got our, our biggest yield of spring barley after that because they fixed so much nitrogen. We got them, we got sowed it actually after winter barley. And then uh, we put, we just peas and then vasilia, radish, fetch, a bunch of stuff. And I think we did it over four ton on spring barley in that area. It was about 300 acres on that area of ground the following spring. So basically what we're saying is it's, 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 it's mixing and matching um, the cover crops to, to kind of get the best of attributes of each. Like we have a seven way magic mix now with radish, phacelia, vetch, uh, a clover, uh, there's buckwheat in it. Um, well, there's a bunch of stuff in it. Like So it's, it's all about kind of working that way and like the like the likes of German and these people are doing a lot of work on new varieties and um a new um new new attributes to each of these things and winter winter hardiness is the biggest one vigor and winter hardiness is what we are looking for like you know we want a cover crop to get up and going because the way the harvests are going now we're getting later and later sown these cover crops um so like last year we didn't have great cover crops, but this year we we we're very good because we kind of got we kind of wiped it over kind of the end of August and early September. But we're always looking for crops to kind of jump up and go because um it is an issue in Ireland that that you're coming into a hardy winter that um that uh you've um you're they're dying off a bit quick. Um the other side of the cover crops is what you'll see is um um you'll see um kind of retain moisture now you might say that think that sounds strange but if you see on tillage ground here in Wexford and it, it happens around the country when you get into the spring and you saw your first block of land and you're getting to your last 100 acres or 300 acres or 400 acres and even when the crops you have sowed you can see this issue of, of, of land starting to dry out and on spring crops germination is so important to get them up and going that retain moisture is actually very important toward the end of the spring so what the cover crops tend to do is that since the soil is kind of, um, how would you say, like, like it's just that bit more lively or something, it, it, it holds the moisture, the roots that, that are left over from the cover crop hold the moisture in place um, that gets you out and gets the crop kind of up and away quicker because it has the moisture. Now, what you'll say is that sometimes when you go in and start tilling first with the cover crops, you'll know that it is a bit damper. Um, like lads around here probably get going two days earlier than we do but in the end it kind of works out better for us um, next slide please Declan so you'll just see some of this here like on the left there on the right is what you kind of see is these uh, it's kind of like uh, dreadlock roots and they say that's a sign of actual, actual soil building it's, it's hummus building in the soil and um, they're, they're microbes and stuff locking on and it's actually building hummus in the soil. So that's what the science is telling us. Yeah. Um, next slide. So there's just an example of cover crop we've sown on the right there and on the left, kind of there's about two weeks in the difference um, there this year. So we've had, we have pretty, pretty happy this year with what, what we're seeing. Uh, next slide. And there's an example of a tillage radish on the left there now. So you see it like, that's not just the length of it because there's this tiny tap root that goes on the whole way down through it so as you can see there's plenty of biomass below the ground and above the ground so they're they're kind of a fundamental part of cover crops in this country really so um next slide sowing now i think this is the be all and end all of of, of cover crops like you can talk about the 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 hummus and the fungi and the mycorrhizae and stuff but 
you won't get any of that benefit if it's not sown correctly. And I think that's an issue that a lot of farmers in this country run into. They deem the cover crop uh, a glass payment or whatever, throw it in there and forget about it. Like, and then they're given out then that it's not growing or it's not doing this. And um, we find, we use a, a three different tools to do it. We use either the Vatterstead top down that you see that's parked on the quad track there. We use a Vatterstead carrier. I don't have a photo that there now, but or we use a, a vader set spirit drill. Now, I don't really like using the drill to do it uh, because it's just kind of rough on the drills going in on stubble ground, but the top down and the carrier are the best tools for it. Um, we find generally the top down is the best because with straw, if you get, say, like if the weather breaks during the harvest and you, you're cutting spring barley and you've, say, we have a thousand acres cut, we've another thousand to go or something, the machines come back on the land after the weather lifts the, the machines are now back on the land and they're kind of they're they're compacting the land a bit the lads bailing with the trailers and the trans stackers and the, the loaders they're compacting the land a bit so sometimes the land can come a bit hard and the discs kind of tend to not get enough tilt to get the cover crop going so we find sometimes the top down is nearly the best tool for it but the disc will cover more ground so it's all, it's all dependent on the farm and, and, and conditions but um, the other very important side to someone is you have to roll it. We roll every cover crop um, that uh, we sow because they're all tiny seeds. If you look at a if you if you could open a bag of cover crop seed, like the seeds are absolutely minuscule. So seed soil contact in order to get it going is very important, and especially when you're getting later in the season, you need it even more. So we'd have a guy here rolling constantly uh, after the after the after sowing the cover crops there's a lot of guys around here before they go cut and we'll go roll for an hour or two just to to to, to keep ahead of it like so i think that's i think that's i i genuinely think that's the, the biggest problem in the country is that they're not being sown right and i think they need to invest in their equipment to sow so whether it be i think the idea of like i know i said i spread out the peas but we came afterwards with a disc and basically till the peas in whereas a lot of guys spread it out and then roll it in and some years, the likes of this year, that was fine. But I think nine times out of 10, if you really want a, a top quality cover crop, you need to get that little bit of tilt, that two or three inches um, on top of the ground just to get get it, get it the vigor going. So I think that's the main point to focus on when it comes to cover crops. Um, next slide, please. Management. So another kind of thing that some guys, we have a lot of guys around here in Tony Furlan, we get them to do it. We, after the cover crop is established and the volunteers are up, we spray them all off with Falcon or, or whatever brand you may have. Um, and people might think that sounds strange because you're, 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 you're spraying again, but there's a couple of reasons for doing it. Um, we, um, first of all, the, the volunteers will outcompete the cover crop if you have, if you have uh, what you call a Schumacher combine drivers, which we have four of them down here. So you kind of... Uh, you can you can end up having these just streams of of of, of, of volunteers like and no cover crop and that's not what you're wanting so that's the number one reason for doing it you're also breaking a disease cycle so by by having volunteers carrying the hoe into the spring you, you have this disease cycle so you're constantly breaking that you're increasing your chance of getting more disease in the barley next year yeah the falcon will get a lot of weeds um it's not hectic on a lot of weeds but it'll still it still take out some of them. So you basically, you're just allowing, you're just treating it like a grown barley, like you're looking after and you're getting a bigger cover crop. Falcon is not dear to do or any of those kind of sprays aren't exact, aren't overly expensive. So um, it's, the, it's, it's, it's paramount to us uh, on our cover crop thing because you will end up kind of with weaker cover crops if you don't do it. So it, it, it's, it's very important to us. Um, next slide, please, Ethan. Destruction of cover crops. Now, there's two. Uh, there's two ways of doing it. There's there's spraying it off with glyphosate. We use about a half kg or a kg of Power Max, and uh, depending on the year or how quick we want to kill it. And then the other option is going out and rolling it in the frost. Now, say the likes of the last two or three days here, we will have a certain amount of kill off. Like the buckwheat will all die you now with that frost. The buckwheat can't stick frost. There's plenty of other varieties are are not hectic on frost. It won't kill them instantly, but some of, the, some of the varieties that you saw will naturally be dead by January or end of February, say. Um, then you have to go out and spray off with 
uh, with Roundup, but you can also go rolling in the frost. So you, you basically snap the, the stem and the frost kills the cover crops. Now, that does involve getting up at three or four o'clock in the morning to go rolling. Um, and it's not exact, always exactly practical, um, but it is a way of doing it as well. And you can see on the right-hand side there, that's one day, that's one of the nights we did go rolling. And you can see how it's after rolling in. And then people always ask us, like, what about residues and stuff? If you look like that, where that's till there on the left-hand side in that photo, like we had a monstrous cover crop there and it's gone within within a week or two. Like, um, in terms of grazing, I'm no nutritionist or I'm not a, a cow or a cattle expert by any stretch of imagination, but a lot of guys saw cover crops around here. Uh, for grazing now you can't use some varieties you have to just specify what varieties you want for grazing but um companies like us sell grazing specific varieties the only thing i'd say with grazing is uh not to overgraze it because one of the key components to cover crops is protecting the soil over the winter so basically acting as a shield um because they say that rainwater hits the soil at 50 or 60 miles an hour or something something crazy i think it could even be higher and what you will notice is, is that if you if you have a field, say a cover crops and, and a stubble field, the, the stubble field will slump. The soil will actually compact itself on top of the ground. And when you go into till in the spring, you'll get this lumpy soil because the rain is after hammering it all winter. Whereas the cover crops will protect the soil and keep it, keep it fluff, basically, like fluff. So if you are grazing it, don't leave the cattle or whatever you have on it too long and take and wipe out the cover crop because you'll just end up with this the cap it and it'll, it'll come back it'll till up muddy like you know what i mean the importance of glyphosate this is this system can't really work without glyphosate and i think the americans are, are, are arguing that strongly because cover crops are becoming a massive thing over there due to soil erosion more so than anything and um, it'd be very difficult to do this system without it so I think as, a, as in terms of anyone who's lobbying or talking to people about glyphosate and stuff, I think it's in order to farm environmentally friendly, you know, the way we're doing it, which I, I think is environmentally friendly. I hope it's environmentally friendly. And um, glyphosate is an extremely, um, extremely important uh, tool in that uh, system. So um, next slide, please, Declan. Um, fertilizer savings. I find it funny that I'm talking about fertilizer savings considering the target is here, but... We've probably cut back on nitrogen on the farm 10 to 15 units, roughly, uh, given where it is or what, what we're doing. That's like a can this year. That's probably 25 euro a unit, roughly, this year. So um, we're seeing major benefits in that. On, on our indexes, our indexes just seem to just grow, grow quicker, if you know what I mean. We're nearly index four on all our spring barley ground now. And that's because our the 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 nutrient retention, the organic matter is increasing, and it's just the nutrients are being withheld in the soil. So we've cut back on potash. I think we cut back what we do we ask? I think it was thirty units last year. Um, so we can we're seeing massive savings on fertilizer. Um, now bear in mind this is over a fifteen year period. It's not going to happen overnight. Um, but like it, it's happening Be pesticide savings is another thing like it's it's to do with the breaking the cycles so with cover crops you're bringing in natural predators i wouldn't go as far as saying we're cutting on pesticides but we're definitely not seeing an issue with pesticides ever uh, or pests on the farm because we've natural predators hanging around after the cover crops and we're breaking the cycle if you just keep sowing spring barley or keep sowing whatever spring crops you'll have this monoculture and they say that the more monoculture you have the more issues with resistance and stuff you're going to have same with the grass weeds, uh, we're hitting them twice, once with the falcon and then with the roundup at the end. So I can't remember the last time we had a weed situation where, where we, like our weed problems are never bad in the spring. Um, metal and diesel. Metal, in terms of metal, we are getting uh, thousands of acres out of hips, not thousands of acres, but we're getting way longer than we used to out of, um, out of any of the hips we have on our top down. And what we notice a lot is with diesel so if we have a new farm like i noticed this spring i was we had a new farm that we got last year or two years ago that we only had say cover crops in it for two years and i went to a farm then literally about 15 minutes down the road that we didn't and the difference in the tractor is about a kilometer like on the quad track like you're you're they're just run the top down will just the quad track just run away of the top down in the cover crop soil that's been in cover crops for 
for 15 years. The ground is just more fly, friable around the gates, everything. She's just burning way less diesel when she's in that ground. When she's in kind of relatively new ground, there's more of a pull. I, I, I don't have trials on it. It's, it's not scientific. It's just, it's just, I know from sitting on the tractor that that's what we see. Um, we're definitely massive diesel savings. Um, next slide, please, Declan. Uh, so if you look at this, like on the right there is a sign of the, of the kind of the, the, the fungi in the soil and the clubby roots. Um, of, of, that's, that's, that's all in relation to the, to the cover crops. The spade in the middle is just shows you that tilt. That's the facilia working. That's the facilia creating that kind of powder on top. Um, just a real friable soil. And the big ignorant boot on the left, that's about, uh, what we know, that's about three weeks. So I remember in the end of November, or maybe it was the end of October, we got this two or three days of torrential rain, I think three or four inches or whatever it was. I went down to one of our cover crops, the one of the cover crops that was sown after winter barley. And it's on kind of South Wexford soils, which we, I know everyone says like, the, you know, we're on Lomi soils down here, but South Wexford will be a little bit heavier. And I walked across the field, uh, I went maybe four or five hundred yards and back in after rain for three days solid, ground was still saturated. And I came back and that was what was on me on on me uh on the bottom of my boat, no clay, because the water is just getting away. The water is not sitting on the field, it's not capping the soil, it's not creating muck. The water is running down through the roots and it's and it's it's filtrating basically. So it'll just show you the benefits you can have over the winter. And next slide, please, Declan. So carbon farming, um, I'll start with like waterways, for instance, we've just right behind me here, there's a, the field is a bit like that. And there's just the water used to run for years right down the middle of the field when, it, when we get heavy rain. We haven't seen that now, well, before my time, but we haven't seen that in about eight or 10 years because we've been sowing constant cover crops up there. And at the bottom here, there's a drain, the water used to come out really dirty and clay. So obviously there's all nutrients coming out in that too. That glass is from that stream after about four or five inches of rain a couple of years ago. The water was just spotless coming over because the cover crops is filtrating. It's not letting the roots or it's not letting the nutrients or the clay get away. So that's and that's a massive thing in Wexford at the moment because we have issues with nitrates in Slaney. Um, the land going up either side of the River Slaney, Bally Carney's all in tillage ground. And there's runoff of nitrates and stuff into the water there at the minute. So we think cover crops would make a massive difference to that situation. Now, as, as a lot of these are probably saying, uh, this sounds expensive, like the spraying and the cover crops and all the rest of it. What we done, Philip kind of done a, a carbon, uh, what would you call it? A, a carbon uh, study on the farm about three years ago, or four years ago, even now to stage. And we were given this cool farm tool to do uh, carbon analysis of the farm. And when we input all our figures, both winter crops and spring crops, we were actually sequestering about, about 900, here, 982 kilos an acre of, uh, of cover crops, or of uh, carbon. So we couldn't really believe this. We were shocked by this because obviously it's great news nowadays that this is happening. So we approached the Agio with this um, this study that we've done and they they're absolutely over the moon because obviously the agio is one of the Azure's biggest inputs are is mountain barley is barley so if they can buy new environmentally friendly barley that's obviously a lot better for their business so we analyzed a lot of our customers and we've actually the Azure have given five of our customers awards this year on being carbon friendly because they're doing the same system as we're doing we are going to hopefully eventually i'm not saying it's going to be this year or next year get a carbon payment. Now, whether the cap will be separate to that, but hopefully, uh, uh, whether it be Diageo or Bortmalt or even feed mills in this country, will have to look at maybe paying extra for carbon friendly barley. Um, that's, what, that's, that's the area we're hoping for. So whether it be a 10 or a ton, 20 euro a ton, 30 euro a ton, but hopefully it'll be definitely enough to cover the cost of, of, um, of sowing cover crops. But, uh, even at that, like our average yields, um, say since 2009 are up 0.4 of a ton or point. We're averaging three and a half, 3.6 ton of spring barley every year on this farm. We're not getting, in 2018, when we had the drought, we didn't get this big collapse in yields. 
we still averaged about 2.7 or 0.8 when everyone else was averaging 2.3 and 4.5. So uh, I, I personally think there is still a long-term benefit to cover crops if you don't get a, a financial benefit because with diesel and fertilizer savings, it all adds up. But this, hopefully, this is the way everyone's talking about trading carbon. Uh, a ton of carbon they're saying is worth 200. I don't know what it's worth, but I've heard 200 euros a ton or whatever. Um, but the key to that is... The key for us being carbon friendly was the cover crops. Cover crops and mint hill. We've um, we, 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 we just fiddled around with figures for ages and put in different stuff and put in plowing and all the rest of it. And for plowing, we're not we're not carbon uh, neutral um, or carbon sinkage, as, as I should say. We're um, so the, the, the fundamental part of that plan was mint hill and, and, and cover crops. So that's kind of where we see it going. Like I think tillage farming is actually in a is in um the driving seat when it comes to the environmental thing because with this kind of stuff we can be carbon friendly. Um, you know, like we're, everyone the agriculture is under the 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 microscope now at the minute. So we kind of have to be seen to be doing something. Like we can't wait for legislation or government stuff. We kind of have to go out and do it ourselves. Like if you look there. On the right is, is beehives. We get farmers to bring in beehives around the rate just for pollinators and stuff. Um, if you go to the next slide, Declan. Oh, yeah, sorry. I'll go on to uh, there's Terracan at the bottom of that. I'll, go, I'll get to Terracan at the end. But this is organic matter improvements on our farms and so on. And I, and I think this this is the other side of the cover crops. And this is the other side why we're sequestering carbon is because our organic matter has grown so much. We started sampled the whole place in 2009. Well, a lot of places, but we just took out these. Um, these couple of fields and then we did it again in 21 and as you can see the improvement in organic matter is absolutely massive anywhere from 55 percent up to 75 percent um you know you were told in college that you could only increase organic matter by one percent over 40 years and um, this is solely down to cover crops we don't import any slurry we don't import any dung it's all cover crops continuous cover crops for 15 years basically and these aren't the other side of it is these aren't heavy soils like these if you look at say uh, the slate field that's uh, that's a shale field that's there's only literally top of the lane here it's very very light ground and that's after growing 58 percent and they say it's very difficult to grow organic matter in light ground so this this was a big revelation to us as well and you know we always hear that import slurry import farmyard dung and and do if you can but around here a lot of the time it's not practical it doesn't work the slurry comes in in the middle of January and destroys the whole place so the slurry is not that good uh, a lot of the times you'll do more damage spreading it with, with machinery and stuff as you will I'm not saying it's a bad thing what I'm saying is it's not that practical whereas cover crops will be there every single July, August, September or so we, like, they'll always be there to be bought and sold so it's, 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 it's a continuous way to grow organic matter in our opinion um, next slide Declan please so this is we're doing wildflower margins uh, there's a lot of talk about wildflower this year with black grass and stuff we didn't find any of it uh, I don't think Jarman even found any of it when they went about it I think it was a bit of a storm and hiccup but we've been sowing them all around the place um, and it's, it's, it's creating pollinators and, and that side of thing but even the reaction from the public like and like we're under scrutiny everyone's under scrutiny in agriculture now from the public we're getting a great reaction from the public about these like that's great that we're doing it and makes the place look great and all the rest of it like and I think that's very important um this is all a part of carbon farming like this is all a part of sustainable farming like say the sprayer there we're using agri-fact 36 meter booms with low drift nozzles um so like that's another part of GPS spreaders uh automatic shut off all that kind of stuff this is all accounting for in these studies and I think this is the way it's going to go in the next three or four years I'd say more and more into this direction I think I, I don't have crystal ball but that's what it's looking like at the minute. Uh, next slide, please, Declan. This is a product that we've developed here in Target with, with, with Brandon Bioscience that we're going to use blanket across the farm this year. So basically, Brandon Bioscience are a company based in Kerry and they formulated a, a, a biostimulant using seaweed. So basically what we do is they turn that seaweed into a liquid and we, we spray it onto the fertilizer. And what this liquid does is it basically speaks to the roots and the roots take in the nitrogen quicker and you get 20 to 25 percent more efficiency out of um out of your um 
can we're using it on say can well as kind of a salt can so can with sulfur and there's a couple of other blends there but with the fertilizer market is sure we don't know we'll probably just be maybe with the can so basically that means your standard salt can bag is is 27 units and four units of sulfur give or take different brands you're now going down to 22 units uh with three units of sulfur and get the same effect so it's going to be a big thing for dairy farmers obviously in derogation and what have you but it will eventually, I think it will become a thing on tillage farms because it'll come down to your carbon score. And when it comes, hopefully when it comes for payments, whether it be cap payments or private company payments, your carbon score is going to matter. Um, so it'll have an effect on that. So basically, like, like I said, it's a coated seaweed and it gives it gives 25% more, um, more uh, benefit out of it nitrogen you're using so you can reduce your nitrogen so we're using a 22 unit nitrogen as opposed to 27 units so that's your 20 25 percent um that's kind of it uh and that's like i don't want to ram our way of farming down anyone's next that's not the way we do it like i just was asked to do it so i said i'd uh, give a chat and any questions um more than welcome thanks yeah no that that's really brilliant walter Th thank you very much i, I, th I thought it was very interesting just with the um, cover crops there or even on lighter soil with the water retention and, and, and the hot, deep, deeper rooting and stuff is, I suppose Lillian that's probably all feeding into um, the carbon storage in those lighter soils and that, that's why you're increasing your organic matter and um, so that was very insightful. Um, Declan's going to come in there now with, uh, with a few questions I see a, a few coming in there. Um, Declan? I suppose the first one was in relation to Lillian's graph on the Mac. Uh, I don't know. Do you want to share that screen again, Lillian? Just... Um, yep, yeah, sure. Um, okay. Okay. Oops. It was just asking about the graphs on the Mac, and can you just go into them in a bit more detail? Okay. Yep, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sorry, I'll just put that in presenter mode there. Can you see that now? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, what the marginal abatement cost curve represents is the abatement or the carbon saving, if you like, associated with different measures relative to their costs. So what you see all along this x-axis, the width of the bar tells you how much um, saving you can get. Uh, that's shown in, in kilotons of CO2 equivalent. It's associated with uh, three different land uses, grassland, forestry, and arable. And then the height of the bar tells you the cost. So here's straw incorporation. Um, it's an expensive measure. Uh, compared to pasture management, um, which is below the zero cost, which means that it's actually the measures that are included in that are cost beneficial on balance uh, to apply. Um, at the moment, we see you know forestry as a land use mitigation option. It's uh, in that MAC at 2.1 megatons of CO2 equivalent. So that's million, million metric tons at national scale. But I think it's one of those things that it's worth mentioning that uh, replantation rates are, are, are falling off. And also we know now uh, many of those won't be replanted that have been harvested because they were often put on peat soils, which on balance uh, over time are actually a net source of emissions. So of course there's a challenge there um, with um, replanting um, along with other challenges that are ongoing in that sector. But effectively that's what that shows you. We also have an ammonia Mac. We also have an agricultural um, Mac, which shows you the different measures, a lot of them relating to um, um, animal health and EBI and different aspects. Uh, but this here is specifically in relation to land use because of today's discussion around, uh, I suppose, soils and um, carbon sequestration and so forth. OK. Yeah. Um, thanks, Lillian. One, for, one or two for Walter there. Just, um, there's a question in relation to cover crops. Are they sown before winter corn? And also, what do you kill the weeds with or how do you manage the weeds? Um, it depends. We have sown cover crops before winter corn, but that's just a time scenario thing. Um, it's, you know, if, if you get the winter barley cut in the 20th of July and you have a bale, you might throw in a cover crop if you're not sown until 
like we so early down here, we go pretty early because we're mint hill. So we could be sown. Like we were finished on the first of October this year, like where most lads did only get going on the first of October. So if you weren't sown to the middle of October and you got your cover crop sown the end of July, you'd have a pretty good cover crop come the middle of uh, come the start of October. So it can be done. It's just the it's just a time frame kind of thing. Um so yeah, it, it does happen, but not it's not common. It's not common. And, and on then, the weeds, we I presume she's whoever asked the question means the weeds in the cover crops, is it? Oh yes. It, um, well, it, on the cover crops, it's, it's Falcon, and then there's there's various off brand stuff with Falcon, and then in the spring, we use Galaxy and whatever general brands there is out there, Galaxy and whatever else. Um, but yeah, on the cover crops side, it's it's kind of Falcon, and there's there's a bunch of different names on it. I can't think of them off the top of my head. Thank you. Uh, Lillian, I'm not sure if you've answered this privately in the Q&A, but there was a question in relation to classification defined as mask. What is that? Do you know? Do you know? Oh, yeah. Sorry. So that's related to the map I showed uh, with the carbon stock. So we were just showing in that map the uh, mineral soil. So in mapping, if you use a mask, it's those areas uh, that aren't being included in what you're showing. So in that instance, uh, the the peat um, soils all along the western seaboard um, were masked out but also if you've sealed soils in urban areas those are also part of the mask or rock outcrop etc so those then are just um, isolated out by use of a mask that's uh, that's what what's used in, in mapping for that purpose okay there for Walter uh, how would you how would management of cover crops change if Roundup and Falcon was not available should be extremely difficult like there's no there's no two ways about it like you'd, you'd have to hope for frost in a lot of senses like like in terms of the falcon sometimes like there's guys around here that will use the falcon and there's guys who don't have a volunteer problem or don't maybe mightn't have bad weeds after the harvest and they won't use it like so just it just depends on your situation like the falcon uh, we find the falcon very beneficial because it just you get a bigger cover crop after but if it was to disappear, you just have to slow down the combine a lot and you'd have to do the other approaches. But in terms of getting rid of the glyphosate, like it is, it comes down to rolling it, like it comes down to rolling it in the frost to kill it. There might be some, you know, yourself now, glyphosate might disappear and something else will come along that'll kill it. And um, so it, it would be, it would make, it would make the system a lot more challenging. It'd make, it'd make min till in general. That's, that's the argument that's been had in America, I'm fairly sure, that direct drilling and min till would become a lot more difficult. If they were to get rid of a uh, roundup and therefore the more tilling you do the berry grass weeds and stuff the more carbon you release so that's the, i think that's the argument they're making over there i'm not sure who the question is aimed at from bridget there but can you explain more about the desiccation of ground cover in the spring i think it could have been during during your presentation walter yeah i'd say it's just uh it's just basically uh, the desiccation means when, when you come into february we usually spray it off depending on the weather uh the end of february um and it's just basically killing the cover crop before the before the um before we start sowing our spring crops now like the odd year we get caught with it because you might spray it off the end of february then you get a, a wet three weeks like and now you have kind of a bare soil before you go i like going in with the grubber when it's not totally green but because it'll it can cause issues with dragon and stuff i like going in when they're still a decent bit of residue there because it just means that it's been protected so it's about it's kind of, it's kind of a timing thing spray off around the end of february or early march whenever a couple of weeks before you you, you plan on going so on so perfect uh, and another one for you Walter. there as a grassland farmer what can we learn from tillage crop rotations tillage crop rotations yeah yeah um we're rotations massive here like we we're we have 680 acres of rape sown this year, it's the most we've ever sown. Um, last year, any of the crops we had after rape, the barley, uh, the winter barley done 4.9, 5 ton. Um, wheat, knocked on door, 5 ton. Spring barley, like I said, average in tree. We, we generally don't rotate the spring barley ground as much. This, this year now, we, ha we, we did a couple of blocks of spring barley ground that have been spring barley for 15 or 20 years and put rape into them. But... We're just seeing massive yields, and in terms of rotation on a spring farm or a on a grassland farm, are you meaning in the sense of kind of sowing bread crops on your 
grass farm or is it kind of different species or multi-species swords or, or, or where is it coming from in, in, in the sense of that? Um, maybe part of you can put another I, I, I read that one, Walter, just as in um, we're focusing on tillage with your presentation and how, how does that affect the grassland farmer? So I was actually just going to ask there, um, with multi-species then um, incorporated into grassland farmers with the different roots and depths and things mm. that are involved with that, it's probably a similar scenario and um, maybe in particular with mineral soils would that be more beneficial or what's your thoughts on that oh definitely like uh, i'm not an expert on multi-species now but i, I was talking to the other day and, and there's clovers in them and there's chicory in them and there's, there's all this kind of stuff in them so it'd definitely be better for soil biology in terms of not just having one variety in the soil so it'd have to be good for it'd have to be good for organic matter and humus and and just general soil biology on the farm would definitely have to be good for yeah. And I suppose just if I might come in there too, I suppose uh, they also have different, um, I'm neither an expert on, the, on it either, but uh, certainly different species have different properties that lend themselves well to having adaptive capacity, I suppose, as we move forward into this, um, you know, in a climate change area, there's, you know, there's certain uh, species with greater rooting depth that can access more water, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's, there's quite a, a lot to think about there that uh, can add value in addition to obviously the carbon story as well. Yeah, I suppose one thing that um, struck me is, you know, you have your your soil structure, your, your roots and everything are adding to that and adding to the, to the storage potential um, and the organic matter potential, the, the drainage benefits that um, yeah. c come off that as well. And then wh what about compaction then in compacted soils? Is, is, that a, is that a hindrance on sequestration potential maybe on either tillage or grassland farm? Well, certainly, I suppose any time you have a compacted soil, um, that impedes rooting depth. So it makes it difficult for the plant to root down. Um, so, of course, then, yeah, that can, um, you know, limit the potential, certainly. So, of course, um, we, we are learning more and more the whole time about how to better manage compaction and uh, making sure of our soil conditions and not trafficking when wet and different with tires, et cetera, et cetera. Because again, of course, that also, if you're trafficking when wet, uh, as Walter mentioned earlier, going in, um, you know, early on when the soils are too wet, potentially, um, what you can end up with is a scenario where you've run off into, um, into waterways and environmental losses. And of course, um, we neither want that environmentally, but also it's a cost. It's a loss to farmers, you know, certainly you want your uh, nutrients to be, you know, to be taken up by your plants. And obviously that's the uh, and that whole compaction because that is obviously identified as one of the key um, threats to soil quality in Ireland uh, associated with the management regime um, you know that's been recognized here as something we need to manage very carefully. Um, I know this question was asked um, I, how far away and I know there's a massive process um, with verification and all of that with um, the trials and the experiments that you're involved in, but how far away are we from being able to go out on farm and measure if a particular farm of 100 acres with um, five kilometers of a hedgerow of saying, you know, this is your carbon storage potential in those hedgerows or, or indeed the soil? How yeah, far well, I there? suppose already we do have, um, you know, it's reasonable to say that there has been quite a lot of work done already, uh, but the project we're involved with in the first is for the first time taking um, direct measurements that allow us to validate remote measurements and ultimately the end point of that is to be able to assess uh, stock changes over time. But I think even though we hear large numbers in terms of extent, it's important to think or understand that stocks uh, such as carbon are measured on a per hectare basis. So when you start to drill down to how much a hedgerow is there on a, on a, I'd have to go through the numbers in my mind again, but you know, if, if you think that, um, uh, you know, it's quite likely I've done a, a 
back of the envelope calculation of um, you know, a 60 hectare dairy farm, you're only talking about maybe reducing it to a 58 hectare. So it's not a huge, huge amount, but it's still all part of um, the whole system because it's not only from the carbon um, perspective, of course, obviously hedgerows have a lot of other important uh, benefits. Um, but another point that was also raised in the questions is uh, this whole area of what you do need and you do need um, uh, for inventories, you, you need your different carbon pools and that's not only your above ground biomass, that's the litter inputs, that's looking at your root biomass, it's also isolating out your roots, fine roots lower than two millimeters. So to move in that direction is a lot of work. Uh, we already have some estimates and what we're doing in this work now is refining those with these direct measurements. Um, and those are currently moving through the lab and we would expect to have that methodology hopefully published and out there in, in um, you know, summertime, I suppose, next year, towards the end of summer next year. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, is, have we time for one more pressing question? If there's a burning one there, Declan, other, otherwise we'll wrap it up. I'm just conscious we said 12.15 and we're 16 now, which is which is great. There's there's one or two questions just left on the on the catch crop and a different question. So I'll just I'll pose two there together. Uh, is the rape sown and grazed in situ or is it incorporated into the soil water? Uh, and then following on from that, um, it takes very significant quantities of cover crop to, to uh, cover crop material to increase soil organic matter by 1%. What yields of fresh material per hectare are you achieving with your cover crops? On the rape, the rape is just sold as a cash crop, so it's not, it's not, it's not for, uh, it's not for graze. So we saw that at the end of August, from middle of August, remember, and then harvest the following July. On the fresh weight thing, we never me measured the fresh weight off it, but there are studies come out actually this week, and I see it on Angerland there during start week that. Basilia was doing about 35 tonne a hectare and radish was doing about 40 tonne a hectare. That changes every year because it's all to do with how much um, how much how how big the crop is. Like, but like all as I said, we sampled our farm in 09. We we have had all these these farms in continuous cover crops since then. They've went we sampled them again in 2021 and the organic matters were up 55 to, to what did I say, 75 percent. So like we were shocked by this. Like we didn't expect to see this. Um, now we had read in America and in studies before Philip had done a lot of research that this was going to increase our organic matters, and um, by the that by the studies they had done over there and in the UK. And when um, when we seen this increase, we were we were quite shocked as well. So because we were always taught you couldn't do it either, like that it wasn't possible. But it seems that the science maybe might be changing on it. So maybe this is proof of it, but. Um, we've never went out and cut our cover crops and measured what gains on it. Like, you know, we've never done that Perfect. or what volume is on it. Perfect. Just while you're there, Aoife, uh, I, just, I can see Walter and Walter and Lillian are, are answering questions in the chat as they come in as well. So if I didn't get to your question, hopefully Walter and Lillian have been answering in the background as well. Perfect. Perfect. No, that's great. Look, at, um, I'm afraid that's all we have time for today, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank both our speakers, um, Lillian and Walter, for two very excellent and informative presentations um, and addressing um, most of the questions I think that were posed. Um, there they are probably one or two more which we will go through and share um, with you guys, Walter and Lillian, and we, we can get back to whoever has posed them on that. Um, thank you also to uh, my two colleagues there, James and Declan for their technical support and Declan's help for um with the questions. Um, if you're not already a member of the NRN, um, go onto our website and sign up there. It's, it's free. You can just look it up on nationalruralnetwork.ie. Um, and finally, thank you very much to everyone who tuned in this morning. Um, these recordings will be made available um over the coming days. Um, and I hope you all have a lovely day. And I was trying to think earlier on if it was going to be too early to wish everyone a happy Christmas, but I decided why not? Happy Christmas, everyone. That's great. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks very much.